Hello everyone and welcome back. Uh, in the first part of today's lesson, we are going to finish the unfinished business from the last lesson and that was on introduction to subsurface exploration. Uh, and in the second part, we are going to talk about some of the most commonly used intrusive methods for subsurface exploration. So let us begin with the uh, subject matter of the uh, of the lesson, what is what are the objectives? Uh, so we are going to look at the procedures for description of uh, rock material during a subsurface exploration process obtained during a subsurface exploration process. We are going to see how to maintain uh, uh, the how to maintain an appropriate field record documenting all the proceedings uh, during. Uh, proceedings of a subsurface investigation uh, process. And then we are going to describe the procedures for test pit exploration, trenching, drilling and sampling, uh, list some of the relative advantages and limitations of these procedures. Okay, so we begin with the unfinished part of the last lesson. So uh, we were we finished the de description process for soil samples, field description of soil samples and now we are going to get into the field description of rock samples. Now field description of rock uh, samples should include the state of weathering, how weathered is a sample is and we are going to give uh, systematic categories of uh, all these aspects. Then we are going to describe the structure of a rock sample. Uh, we are going to describe in very uh, crude manner what is the expected strength of the sample, what would be the expected strength of the sample, whether it is going to be relatively strong or weak. Then we are going to name the rock type, we have to talk about the color of the rock sample and we have to provide the discontinuities that are uh, there within the rock mass in the form of joints or slick and sides or uh, partings. Uh, uh, or that kind of stuff. Okay, so we begin with the description of weathering state. Now a rock could be fresh if it is free from any, any aspect of weathering, relatively free from all signs of weathering. Then it could progressively uh, be more and more weathered and it could end up with a state which is designated as extremely weathered uh, state in which the entire rock sample is composed of decomposed uh, material, decomposed uh, pre-existing rock material. Okay. So there are uh, three intermediate states. The first one uh, in the order of increasing weathering, the first one is slightly weathered where there is no discolor discoloration, discoloration is only visible on the main discontinuities, main joint sets and not in other uh, minor discontinuity uh, locations, then the rock could be moderately weathered. If the rock is less than 50 percent decomposed and this is composed mainly of interconnected framework of fresh rock, so unweathered rock is uh, it composes the majority of the uh, entire volume of the rock and they are going to be interconnected. So they the unweathered part of the rock mass will not be uh, present in general as isolated uh, islands or isolated patches within the entire volume. Then the rock volume could be highly weathered. In this case, you are going to look at a uh, rock mass composed of more than 50 percent decomposed material, but here the decomposed material are in uh, are continuously are, are in a continuous connection to each other and the undecomposed material they exist as relatively discontinuous isolated uh, pockets within the volume of the rock. And then finally you have got extremely weathered state in which the entire rock mass is composed of decomposed uh, or weathered rock as we have already uh, seen. Then the second thing is structure. Now some of these terms are already known to you when we are trying to classify uh, 
different types of different categories of rock, different categories of uh, volcanic, sedimentary and metamorphic rocks. So, the first type of structure uh, which was also there and we have got it here as well is massive where uh, the rock mass is composed of relatively homogeneous uh, body and uh, basically no bedding, uh, no bedding planes or such type of uh, features are uh, there within the mass of the uh, within the volume of the rock. Then the second type of structure is crystalline structure and we have seen this term uh, earlier as well and this type of structure represents uh, rock to, uh, rocks that are that are that are comprised of interlocked crystals. Then uh, we get into bedded structures we begin in the order of uh, uh, we, we begin from uh, in the order of decreasing thickness of the bedding uh, very thickly bedded here the bedding planes are spaced uh, at spacing of greater than 2 meters from each other then thickly bedded here the spacing could be anywhere between 0.6 of a meter to 2 meters then the rock could be medium bedded here the spacing is between 0.2 meter to 0.6 meter or it could be thinly bedded spacing between 0 0.02 meter to 0 0.2 meter and finally we get into laminated rocks uh, such as phyllites where we have got spacing in between uh, 6 millimeter and 20 millimeter thickness. Then we have to describe roughly the strength of the rock specimen that are obtained during the investigation process. Uh, if the rock again in the scale of increasing uh, strength we begin from the least uh, strong specimen which is designated uh, technically as extremely weak and this type of uh, rock sample can be indented or can be marked with a thumbnail then we have got very weak rock which crumbles under a firm blow of the point of a geologic hammer. Then we could have weak rock in this case the uh, firm blow of geologic hammer of the point of the geologic ham uh, hammer could only uh, cause a shallow indentation shallow marking on the surface of the rock and then we have got strong specimen this type of rock can be fractured by one or more blows of the point of the geologic hammer and then the rock is extremely strong and th this is at the highest end of the strength scale here we can only chip the rock specimen under several blows of the point of the geologic hammer so that is how you describe the strength of a hand sample of a sample of rock specimen that is obtained during the drilling process or the subsurface investigation process. Then we move on to rock type, color and discontinuity. So we have to specify, we have to mention uh, the geologic name of a given type of hand sample. Say for example, uh, micaceous quartzite and this type of classification we have already discussed in detail when we were talking about different types of rocks and then you have to describe the color of the rock and as it was indicated for, uh, for the description of soil hand samples, rock samples also change their coloration with the exposure to the weather. So, colors will have to be described as soon as a rock sample is available during the inv subsurface investigation process and here also we have to describe the primary color and any uh, secondary staining which might be due to the action of uh, groundwater or other agents. And finally, we have to describe the discontinuity uh, within the rock mass and uh, as I indicated earlier discontinuity of rock mass is, uh, is indicated by other, uh, other types of happenings that are recorded during the investigation process such as dropping of drill rods during the 
drilling process or no sample recovery over a certain depth of drilling. Uh, then RQD, RQD is rock quality designation. We are going to look at the details of what is, uh, what is the technical meaning of this term in one of the later uh, lessons. And then we have to talk about the joint sets that crisscross a given mass of rock and the orientation of these joint sets in terms of their azimuth uh, and dip basically. So we have to describe all these discontinuities in a very clearly, in a very clear and systematic manner because these discontinuities can be affecting the overall stability of the uh, structure that might be constructed on this type of, uh, this type of bedrock. Okay. Now, this one here is an example of a soil log, of a soil log that is obtained obtained during a drilling uh, and here you can see that the top portion of the soil log near the top portion of the soil log uh, we give the information regarding the location of the borehole who is the uh, who is supervising the drilling, who is performing the drilling, uh, then what kind of weather was there during the uh, drilling process, during the drilling uh, work, when the drilling was done, uh, what is the top elevation of the drilling and what was the procedure used in the drilling process. So all these things are mentioned in the header portion of this particular uh, format of hand log. And there are several other types of hand logs available, but uh, they are very similar qualitatively. So this is the header portion that we talked about and the, uh, the content of the header portion is also mentioned. Now this is the main log, this is the main portion of the log and here what you see is there is a column near the middle portion and this column describes the geologic units, the geology describes the geologic units. So we will we'll look, look into it uh, in greater detail. Then there is another column here towards the left of this particular log. Now this column is a scale, is the depth scale that means a given geologic unit or given layer of soil or rock at what depth this type of soil or rock is occurring and what is the thickness of that particular layer that in order to understand that we have to mention the depth scale on this particular log. Then there is another column out here. in which the sampling activity during the drilling process is described. So you can see terms like NS here, NS means no sample and then where sample was obtained, soil sample was obtained, there the sample number is indicated on the log itself. And then there is a column of remarks further right and here you are going to mention all those things that you think is going to be having some bearing on the, on the design process of the facility that is being proposed. So for instance here the, uh, the drilling supervisor has recorded the location of the borehole uh, reference with ref reference to a nearby building at the top portion of the remark column at the top portion of the remark column. So that is the location plan and then uh, at an elevation of about 8 feet, uh, this particular depth scale is in feet. So at, at a depth of 8 feet during the drilling process, water was encountered and that is indicated near the bottom portion of this remark column. 
Okay, and also you should notice that further down near the bottom of this particular drilling log, uh, it clearly indicates the depth at which the drilling was terminated. So, that is very essential and below that often times also it is required to indicate how the drilling was back, how the drilling was abandoned, whether there was any instrument installed within the boring or whether it was backfilled after the logging process by uh, some special material or by the drill cuttings itself. So, those things are mentioned near the bottom of a filled soil log. Then we move on to a similar rock log and here also you see near the left portion of the log you have got a description of the bedrock. Uh, for instance, at this site a sandstone, a massive sandstone was encountered as indicated here and then this out here the joints and the dip of the joints are also mentioned and there are some thin layers, thin interbeds of different coloration within the massive sandstone and those things are also mentioned within this uh, column that describes the units of bedrock. And as earlier, further left you have got a depth scale which actually tells us what is the thickness of a soil or bedrock layer or at what depth they are going to be encountered. And then like earlier we have got a column which actually tells us uh, the depths from which core samples were obtained and all these core samples how much recovery or how much RQD uh, are there for these core samples or these hand specimens, they are also indicated on the column uh, next to the column that numbers the box number uh, for retaining the core samples. And finally, further right, you have got the remarks column and here what is typically indicated is what kind of drill bit is used during the coring and from what depth to what depth the uh, a particular core run actually continues. So, all these things we are going to be will make sense, will make more sense after we look at the details of the uh, of the procedures, procedural details of the uh, used in rock drilling, which will come in the in the second part of this particular presentation. Okay, so that finalizes, that actually brings us to the end of the, uh, of the unfinished business from the last uh, presentation and now we get into the description of intrusive methods that are used in subsurface exploration. Okay, what are, what is, what is meant by intrusive methods? In intrusive methods, what we do, actually we try to insert something into the underground formation and we try to recover some samples also in the process and we try to identify these samples right in the field or we take the samples to the laboratory for further testing and identification of the different geologic units. So, basic thing that is done here is to get into the soil volume or rock volume by using some probes or using uh, some drilling tools in order to uh, get, gain an entry into the characteristics or get some insights into the characteristics of the subsurface layers. Now, there are several different types of intrusive testing we discussed earlier and we talked about test pit and trenches and we talked about different types of drilling processes and we are going to look at the details of these processes in the uh, following uh, in the following uh, half of this particular presentation. Okay. So, first we begin with test pits and trenches. So, what is 
test pit and trenches. So test pit and trenches are really a, uh, they are they are holes dug in the ground, holes or trenches dug in the ground, excavations in the ground, and the depths of these test pits or trenches they can extend typically up to about 10 meters. So they are this particular type of procedure is used for investigation of shallow uh, uh, soil and rock layers really or in some cases the depth of investigation can go up to about 20 meters but in this case the sides of the excavation cannot be left unsupported and some temporary support has to be installed in order to take care of the stability of the sides of the uh, investigation of the sides of the excavation. Now test pits are typically about 2 meter in width and trenches are usually 1 meter wide. Now what is this uh, what are these processes used for? These processes are used for uh, excavation of test pit and trenches is done uh, basically to identify the subsurface formation and strati uh, in order to identify the stratigraphy of a given location or a given uh, uh, given location within a site. It is also to done to obtain samples of soil and rock in order to do field and laboratory testing. In some cases actually trenches particularly they are used for assessment of fault activity. Now what is let us let us try to understand the details of these things. So what is a test pit? Say essentially it is an excavation in the ground it is carried out typically like this and this width could go could be could be 2 meters or it could be in some cases more or some cases less and this depth is typically we said is about uh, is less than or equal to 10 meters but if you provide a support a support if you provide an appropriate structural support to ensure the stability of the face of the excavation then the excavation can actually proceed up to 20 meter depth. And this is actually as I mentioned this is less than or equal to 20 meter with support. So what is meant by the face support I tried to schematically show it there. So this one here is a vertical section of a soil or rock that we are trying to investigate. Now here what we, I, what we might see is that there might be a layer of silt near the surface underlain by a layer of sand and say that is again underlain by clay silt. This is just an example uh, of a hypothetical stratigraphy that might have been encountered at a given site. So here again we have got silt on the other side, sand and clay silt. Now as the excavation progresses down you could take disturbed samples from the excavator bucket itself or you could try to recover some undisturbed samples. Now how do you do that? Let us try to understand, uh, let us try to understand uh, how it is done in case of a clay deposit because that is where you might actually get a very high quality undisturbed sample during the excavation of the test pit itself. So this is our test pits and here say we have got a shallow layer of silt near the surface underlain by a thick deposit of clay silt and how the stratigraphy appears that also becomes apparent from the description of the excavation process and identification of the samples from the side of the excavation uh, like along these surfaces. So here we are trying to get 
some undisturbed samples of the clay silt soil. So, for doing that what is done a column of soil is left uh, within the test pit and then this particular soil this particular block uh, this particular block is cut using a wire saw wire saw cutting wire saw and then what you are left with is a cube typically of size of say about 200 millimeter uh, 200 millimeter uh, uh, roughly of 200 milli uh, roughly a 200 millimeter cube and then this particular block is taken out and it is typically wrapped in order to preclude drying up and that wrapping is done by a plastic sheet. So, apply some wrapping and then the entire thing is encased in wax and that is how and, and then after, after, after encasing the whole thing in wax then that particular block can be transported carefully to the laboratory without, uh, without, inflicting without inflicting any damage on the wrapping or causing any disturbance to the soil and this particular process gives you a very high quality undisturbed sample of clay soils and this uh, type of this type of sampling activity is also called block sampling which is performed often as a part part of test pit investigation okay so that is how you get samples of disturbed and undisturbed samples from within the test pit Okay. So, this one this cartoon here shows a schematic of a test pit excavation process. Now, here what we see is that the test pit is actually proceeding from uh, say uh, soil number 1 near the surface, then it penetrated soil number 2. Uh, all these things could be different types of soils like uh, silt or sand or clay silt or uh, any organic material what, what have you uh, then it enters soil 3 and then we have also have got a uh, a lens really of another type of soil called this soil number 4 and we also have soil number 5 in this case. So, during the excavation process itself you can see from what depth to what depth each type of soil is present and you have to describe you have to take hand samples of each one of these uh, different soil types and you have to describe get, uh, describe systematically uh, all these different types of soils using the procedure that was given in the previous lesson okay so that is the details about how a test pit excavation is uh, done and what are the informations available from test pit excavation. Now, advantages of test pit is really is that the holes that are dug in the ground they are accessible for general inspection and the drilling supervisor or the or this or the supervisor who is actually logging the test pit excavation activity has got an access to a very close access really to the different soil formations and of course you can imagine that as the depth of excavation goes down the access becomes more and more limited all right now the second thing the second type of investigation process that we are going to look at uh, that is drilling or boring so what is involved here is is drilling a vertical shaft into the soil or rock and this shaft is typically a, a, a circular hole in the ground really 
and the procedures that are used during the dr for drilling this drilling the hole inclu uh, commonly co the common procedures that are used in the drilling process they include wash boring or auger boring percussion drilling uh, percussion drilling and rotary drilling so we are going to look at the details of all these individual drilling processes as we uh, continue with this particular lesson now uh, first of all we have to we have to understand here is that the drilling process actually the advantage the relative advantage of drilling process as opposed to test pit excavation or trench excavation is that the drilling can be ca uh, drilling process can investigate a relatively thicker la layer of soil and as it can extend to great depths as we are going to see a little while later now this also actually can be done to drill a large diameter hole which can be accessible to the uh, to the drilling supervisor for making a taking a closer look to the uh, to the sides of the borehole and get a feel about what kind of different layers different soil and rock layers one is encountering and also another uh, aspect in this case is important is during the drilling process itself uh, one could take reasonably high quality samples from depths which are which would otherwise not be accessible uh, from uh, accessible by accessible by the process of simple test pit excavation now when the depth of drilling increases quite substantially then access becomes a problem and supervisor drilling supervisor cannot uh, go into the go into the drill hole is because the diameter of the drill hole progressively becomes smaller and smaller as depth increases typically so in those situations an access an indirect access can be obtained to the to to observe the uh, the different type different types of geologic materials that are encountered that are being encountered during the drilling process by means of a borehole camera which, which can be lowered within the borehole to take pictures of the sides of the boreholes. So uh, although the access in this case is relatively limited uh, when you are talking about drilling or boring of a borehole, but in general the sides of the borehole can actually be observed for different characteristics of geologic materials. First we begin with wash boring that is one of the simpler techniques for drilling a borehole in the ground. So what is done here is a heavy chopping uh, bit actually is lowered within the soil layers and this particular chopping bit is, uh, is pounded upon. Uh, it is pounded upon the formation near the bottom of the borehole and it is also actually uh, while, while pounding it is also rotated a little bit not a, not a continuous circular rotary motion but it is rotated back and forth over a few uh, tens of degrees really in the horizontal plane and that causes additional gr grinding uh, it, it, it actually causes it actually leads to an abrasive action uh, bit, uh, because of the uh, because of the friction because of the friction between the drilling drill bit and the rock or soil layer which is underneath the drill bit and also at the same time a jet a water jet or a jet of drilling slurry a slurry of water and uh, mixed with uh, mixed with some stabilization fluid typically such as bentonite that is pumped through the tip of the drill bit and that imparts a scouring action. So because of all these actions simultaneous all these simultaneous actions like scouring and grinding the rock samples or soil samples or, or soil particles they are broken down to smaller pieces and they get carried up the hole by the uh, by the uh, 
by the drilling slurry itself and the bottom of the borehole, bottom of the drilling actually proceeds to deeper depths. We are going to, uh, I am going to try to sketch these activities uh, in the next little bit and we are, going to look, we are going to try to understand the details of these procedures. So here what is done, slurry circulation is done through the drill bit as I indicated earlier that allows us to remove the drill cuttings and also it, uh, it stabilizes, it stabilizes the uncased portion of the borehole. We will see what is meant by all these different terms in the next little bit. Now stratigraphy is interfere, in, uh, stratigraphy of different or different soil layering that are present uh, along the depth of the borehole that is inferred by the driller or uh, by the tiller really how as by how he feels he or she feels during the drilling activity. But that is going to give you a very rough idea, very approximate idea about what kind of different soil layers are there within the borehole. In order to confirm what is there really, uh, what is done, typically the entire drill stem is withdrawn and uh, a dry sample, a dry sample, so called dry sample is taken from, uh, bottom, from the bottom of the borehole. Let us try to understand all these activities. Uh, in a little bit greater detail. So what is done here is to extend a relatively small diameter borehole into the ground and the top portion of this borehole is often supported, often supported using a metal pipe so that the, the soil after the borehole is drilled, it does not collapse into the borehole. So this particular metal pipe is called the casing and then what you have got is a drill bit typically mounted at the bottom of a string of drill rods. So these are drill rods and this one here is the drill bit. So this entire combination goes down in an irregular fa in irregular manner, it is, not, it is not done in a very regular manner and then there is a handle near the top of this particular uh, drill stem and this is called the tiller and this tiller actually is rotated. Uh, back and forth in the horizontal plane as I mentioned earlier and these, these rods are in a sense hollow near the center and through the center of these rods a drilling slurry is circulated. This one is pumping in, pumping in of drilling slurry or it could be plain water, drilling slurry or water. A drilling slurry is typically a typical composition of drilling slurry is essentially a solution, a suspension really, suspension of bentonite, bentonite or other chemical additives 
chemical additives. So these these drilling slurry actually they flush through the tip of the of the uh, of the drill bit, and that jetting action actually scours the soil at in this area. and the scouring action together with the action of tiller and the up and down motion of the drill stem that actually dislodges the particles from near the bottom of the borehole and it gets mobilized and come to the surface it gets flushed to the surface along with the drilling mud so flushing of drill cuttings of drill cuttings is it occurs like this. Now drilling mud also has got another function. You can see that the bottom portion of the holes are typically left uncased. So drilling mud it actually stabilizes the uncased portion of the borehole by preventing the soil within the uncased portion from collapsing into the borehole uh, once the support is removed by the drilling process. So that in a sense is the is the technique of wash boring. Now we want to also also look at what are the advantages and disadvantages of this particular procedure. Uh, what we are looking at in this case is the boring to boring within a relatively shallow layer. Wash boring typically extends to uh, uh, not more than say 50 uh, feet or say 15 or 20 meters. Now the so it cannot typically it cannot go to deeper depths. It cannot be used for highly cemented or hard layers of hard geologic hard layers of geologic units or even soft rocks. They cannot be penetrated by this type of boring technique. And another problem in case of wash boring is that it imparts a great disturbance by the jetting action or by the scouring action near the bottom of the borehole. So any sample that is recovered by inserting a sampler near the bottom of the borehole can be disturbed to a substantial depth from near the bottom of the borehole. So these are the different problems that are there for wash borings. But wash boring is quite popular particularly in India in many parts of India uh, especially in the rural areas because they do not require any mechanical power and the assembly is quite simple and, and light so that transportation of these, uh, instru or these uh, instruments it is relatively simpler in areas which are having limited access to mechanized uh, drilling vehicles. So these are the advantages and disadvantages of the wash boring technique. Uh, now we move on to the next drilling procedure involving the use of an auger. So here also a hole is dug in the ground, a hole is actually uh, a hole is dug in the ground, it is a circular hole and uh, the dig in the digging process what we use is a string of solid or hollow stem augers which are essentially drill rods with helical flutings so that they look like a screw. We will see, a, we will look at a picture of this one in the next little bit. And what is done, these augers, they are kept pressed against the bottom of the stratum and they are rotated by uh, mechanical means such as by using a hydraulic motor and as a result the auger proceeds deeper and the soil cuttings that actually collect on the flutings of the uh, of the screw like uh, uh, augers they actually are conveyed to the surface they ca they get carried to the surface because augers also act as a screw conveyor now from time to time what is done these auger flights they are withdrawn from within the borehole and that also re that also helps us 
to remove the soil samples, uh, remove the soil cuttings within the flutings and it also allows us to take disturbed samples from within the auger flights. Okay. Now, what is it used for? This, this type of drilling can be used for soils and soft rocks only like in the previous case we cannot penetrate hard and highly cemented uh, geologic units and here a hole of up to 1.5 meter diameter can be uh, drilled within the formation and the depths in this case can also be up to 50 meter below the ground surface and actually as the depth increases then the auger equipment becomes quite heavy and unwieldy and the power requirement increases quite substantially as a result auger drilling process becomes quite uneconomical as the depth increases starts to become un uneconomical as the depth increases to beyond uh, 30 meters. So this one here is a picture of a hollow stem auger. Uh, what you have got here is really uh, is a is the hollow stem auger is the pipe that you see this outer pipe is really the hollow stem auger and it has got an auger head with uh, with the properly machined and hard faced teeth that choose into the soils underneath and through the center of the hollow stem auger is another tube that runs to the center and this tube itself has got a pilot bit at the top of it and the chewing action is because of the rotation of the auger head uh, of the auger teeth as well as the pilot bit and the abrasion that it causes to the soil and rock underneath the bottom portion of the auger. So here what is done if you if we look at uh, actually if, if I want to draw on top of this particular uh, picture itself the hole actually proceeds like this. So that is how the hole is going to proceed and this much of diameter of hole will be excavated by this auger. So here again we are going to look at the stratigraphic details of different types of soil and rock that are encountered. So this one here could be soil 1, uh, this could be soil 2, then we could have soil 3 and then we could have uh, soil 4 in this case. So one advantage also of hollow stem auger is very obvious from uh, the discussion here is that the hollow stem auger itself acts as a casing and that actually keeps the soil from collapsing into the borehole. And the hole can be kept open and you can do some dry sampling near the bottom of the borehole by, in, by withdrawing the central rod and lowering a tubular sampler, thick walled or thin walled tube sampler at the bottom of the borehole. There are other types of augers also, other auger types as well, auger types as well which could be uh, uh, which could be solid stem auger or a bucket auger. Bucket augers are of uh, larger diameter typically they can be up to 60 inches in diameter. All right. Now we get into percussion drilling. Percussion drilling essentially pulverizes the po formation by bouncing a heavy drill bit against the soil and rock at the bottom and the cuttings are removed with a baler or a clean out auger. So this is a simple percussion drilling activity and this is useful uh, when a high pressure drilling mud circulation is not acceptable uh, because that might lead to the hydro fracturing of the layer. So in that case percussion drilling is an option. Uh, percussion drilling typically also is a shallow drilling process cannot proceed beyond say about 30 meters depth 
and this has got some of the advantages of the washboarding uh, and so, uh, the disadvantages that are associated with washboarding as well. All right. Now we look at we get into the mechanized drilling process, rotary drilling process. The first one that we are going to describe here is the air rotary drilling. So here we again pulverize the rock at the bottom of the borehole and in this case we use a compressed air driven rotary percussion downhole hammer that is placed inside a core drill bit. And here cuttings are removed by compressed air jet or by using drilling mud and this is not useful. This particular procedure cannot be used in situations where high air pressure becomes unacceptable such as drilling through a uh, water retaining dam or an embankment. Uh, this type of drilling process can penetrate to great depths. It can go up to uh, about say uh, uh, it could it could easily go to 1000 meter depth say and it can it is very effective in penetrating heterogeneous deposits such as those composed of clays and boulders. And finally, we get into mud rotary drilling. This is perhaps the most commonly used drilling process and most versatile. Uh, this particular process actually drills into the soil or rock uh, by having a special type of drill bit. Uh, we are going to see some of the examples of drill bits. They cut through the rock by abrasion and the particles that are generated because of the drilling process, they are floated by circulating a slurry of drilling fluid uh, and flushed to the surface. Drilling fluid circulation also allows to cool uh, for uh, also allows the bit the drill bit to cool down and as we have seen earlier it allows us to stabilize the side of sides of the borehole uh, which is not which, uh, to which the casing cannot be installed. And here uh, uh, we can actually we can actually drill up to say about 300 meter depth and boreholes of up to 1.2 meter diameter can be constructed uh, see i remember when i was when i was describing the air rotary process i was saying that uh, it can it can be used to drill up to 1000 meter depth and that is really a mistake the drilling depth of air rotary drilling can be up to about 1000 feet not 1000 meter and uh, you should note this particular problem and uh, the drilling uh, can go up to a depth which is very similar uh, as in case of mud rotary a few hundred meters really. So air rotary and mud rotary both can go up to a few hundred meter depths. Now what are the advantages and disadvantages of mud rotary drilling? This particular process cannot be used again as in case of air rotary drilling if the pressure of the drilling fluid cannot be tolerated or in pervious formations such as open work gravels where the drilling fluid pressure cannot be sustained because the drilling mud can actually flow through the formation without much resistance. You also have to make sure that you use a drilling fluid which suits the environment which does not cause any damage to the environment. And drill bit that varies quite a bit depending on the formation to be penetrated and whether core samples are to be obtained or not. Some of the examples are going to be seen in the next little bit, next sketch. The sketch, this sketch, the sketch on the left actually shows the process which I have already described. So what you have got here is essentially a drill stream through which you are circulating the slurry and the slurry and cuttings are get back flushed up, ho up the hole and they get collected and this particular slurry is typically recycled again. Some of the drill bits, typical drill bits used in the drilling process is shown on the right. The drill bit on the top left, this one here actually is called a tricone bit. This drill bit is a roller bit. So this one is a roller bit. Uh, this is this here is a tricone bit. Tricone bit. 
and the one on the right is a diamond bit which is which can be used in drilling core samples okay now we try to summarize this lesson what we learned here is a description of the procedures used for intrusive testing then we looked at a list of relative advantages and disadvantages of different procedures used in uh, intrusive testing in addition to it uh, as a part of the previous lessons unfinished business we looked at the procedure for systematic description of a rock hand sample and how a field record can be systematically kept detailing all the uh, necessary detail uh, de uh, all the necessary uh, description of the activities that are there during the drilling process during the uh, subsurface investigation process and finally we wrap the presentation up with a question set try to answer these questions at your leisure uh, first question is what are the methods of intrusive uh, subsurface investigation then second one that I ask is why it is imperative to maintain an exhaustive field record during a subsurface investigation uh, give some examples and explain third one is explain the significance of the following field descriptions of hand samples of uh, a soil really gravelly sand with silt some clay what may be the geologic name of such a deposit try to answer these questions uh, I will try to give you my answers when we meet again until then bye for now thank you very much Hello everyone and welcome back. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, sampling and non-intrusive testing uh, for subsurface exploration. But uh, before we get into the uh, topic of discussion of today's uh, presentation, uh, we are going to look back to the question set of the previous uh, lesson. The first question that I asked was uh, what are the methods of intrusive subsurface investigation basically in the uh, discussion of this particular course we just talked about uh, talked about two basic procedures one is excavation of uh, of a pit or a trench in the ground for exploration of shallow latinas are shielded to eliminate reflection from above ground objects and typically the depth sampled is less than or equal to 10 meter uh, the resolution is not very great in this case and it does not work well for many absorbing material absorbing soil types such as clays. Uh, to summarize this particular lesson what we learned here are different types of procedures for drilling and sampling. We looked at a few common procedures for uh, non intrusive methods of subsurface exploration and then we looked at 